that was filling three large laboratories spread over two separate buildings and it was designed to measure just one particular optical frequency, the red in the combination line of atomic calcium in terms of the microwave frequency of a cesium atomic clock. All these harmonic frequency chains have disappeared now because uh, in the late 90s we came up with this new tool, the laser frequency comb. Uh, a number of books and reviews have been written by now. Uh, if you are interested in the historical uh, developments from my perspective, my Nobel lecture, I think, uh, shows the winding path that led to that idea. But uh, there are recent, there's a recent review, for instance, by Paolo De Natale and co-workers that gives a fairly good overview and a lot of useful references. The frequency comb is a very simple tool. It's based on a femtosecond laser, on a mode lock laser in the simplest form. Such a laser consists of a cavity, two mirrors, and you have a short flash of light bouncing back and forth. So in that respect, it's similar to the Gedanken light clock of Einstein to uh, explain special relativity, except we are talking about a laser, so there's some amplifying medium, and you can keep this going even though you couple out a train of femtosecond pulses. These lasers are not new, they have been evolving over decades and have been used mostly as sources of short flashes of light to study ultrafast phenomena. So why do we call it a frequency comb? People who are interested in precision spectroscopy typically use a different type of laser. They use a single frequency, a single mode laser. So you also have a cavity, but instead of a flash of light bouncing back and forth, you excite just one mode uh, so that an integer number of half wavelengths fits between the two mirrors and out comes an ideal sinusoidal wave. Of course, people who try to build these lasers know that uh, it's very easy to uh, get two modes. Uh, so we have now two different frequencies oscillating at once, two different wavelengths. And if you superimpose them at the output, you will get a beat node. You will get constructive interference if the waves are in phase and destructive if they are out of phase. And you get an a train of very elongated wave packets and inside the cavity the energy is sloshing back and forth. If you have three modes you can make wave packets separated by some period of dark and just five modes are enough to make short flashes of light separated by an amazingly long time of dark where of course all the modes are on, they are all oscillating but they cancel each other through mutual interference. So uh, these are two different pictures of the same thing. We have a short flash of light bouncing back and forth. We have a laser emitting a train of pulses. Or we have many modes oscillating in lockstep. And for this to work as well as in this animation, the spacing in frequency of adjacent comb lines has to be very precisely equal to the repetition frequency of the laser. So I have a comb of equidistant spectral lines and the line spacing is very precisely equal to the repetition frequency. In reality, of course, what guarantees that we have this spacing? Uh, fortunately, the ultrafast community has come up with tricks, with nonlinear tricks. Uh, you can put a saturable absorber into the cavity of a laser, or you can simulate saturable absorption using the optical Kerr effect so that it becomes in the survival interest of these modes to cooperate, to oscillate in lockstep with just the precise frequency spacing so that they can together produce short pulses that then can bleach their path through the saturable absorber. And any mode that doesn't like to play in this orchestra will not be able to take advantage of the bleaching and it will quickly be extinguished. So we have a process of nonlinear self-organization that guarantees a very precisely, a very evenly spaced 
comb of spectral lines. Uh, here is a mechanical analog of such a frequency comb. Imagine that you have a row of pendulums and you trim them so that the first one, say, makes 30 oscillations per minute, the next one 31, the next one 32, and here the last one 39 oscillations per minute, and you let them go. So originally they are all in phase, but very quickly they will go out of phase. Each pendulum corresponds to one of these comb lines, and if they are out of phase, there is destructive interference, and you get dark out of your laser. And it looks almost like it's a random, uh, random phase. It's not, not quite, if you look carefully, you, you see correlations, you see patterns emerge. And uh, for instance, now we are approaching half a minute. So with some practice, you could learn to read time from this pattern of pendulums. Uh, one could have it on one's desktop for meditation, or you could have <laughs> a big one. Uh, for art, for auto art, and after one minute they should all be lined up again. And if they're all lined up again, that means constructive interference, and that's where the motor laser will emit the next short flash of light. So here we are approaching this point, and then it just continues. So this is a mechanical illustration of the frequency comb, and it just, uh, I think, makes the point that this is, is really a very simple uh, tool. Uh, but what surprised most experts is how far these principles could be pushed. In 1999, uh, researchers at Bell Labs uh, demonstrated that you could produce white light if you, put, if you take pulses from a Motlock titanium sapphire oscillator and you send them into a special holy fiber or microstructured fiber with a small solid fiber core surrounded by air-filled holes. So the air-filled holes make sure that you can make the core very small and still guide the light and the intensities are easily large enough that you get an intensity dependent refractive index and other nonlinear effects that broadens the spectrum and you can disperse the white light with a diffraction grating to see a pretty rainbow of colors. Uh, but uh, this process of white light continuum generation, complicated as it may be, is remarkably very reproducible and adjacent at successive pulses are correlated in their phases so that they can interfere and still produce comb lines in the spectrum. So we have this uh, white light, which if you look closely, really consists of a hundred thousand or a million sharp comb lines still spaced very precisely by the pulse repetition frequency of the laser. What we in general don't know is where these comb lines are uh, because the mode locking mechanism guarantees equal spacing but it doesn't guarantee that successive pulses have the same electric field, they have the same pulse shape. So we cannot argue uh, that it's a periodic function and we can describe it by a Fourier series so then the comb lines would be the elements of this Fourier series but instead we can have a phase slippage from pulse to pulse and the comb can be anywhere. But if you have an octave spanning comb one can measure this carrier envelope offset frequency the slippage rate of the carrier phase relative to the envelope by taking comb lines from the red end of the spectrum, sending them through some nonlinear crystal that produces second harmonics and some frequencies, new comb lines that are now shifted by twice this offset. And so you, have to, you can uh, look at the collective beat note of the new comb lines and the original ones at the blue end, and you get an interference signal that is just precisely equal to this carrier envelope offset frequency. If you can measure this frequency, you can take it into account, or you can use servo controls to make it go away, so that you now have no longer any phase slippage, and now you can be sure that each optical frequency is a precise integer multiple of the repetition frequency. And you can use a cesium at atomic clock, say, to measure the repetition frequency, and then you know the frequency of each comb line with the precision of our primary standard of time. Or if you want to make an optical clock, you can take some very sharp lines 
in the optical region in iron 